Good morning. You know, I've realized that the background of these videos probably isn't the best. It's just my office. I haven't made much of an effort to clean up the stacks of books or to dust off my shelves or to make it look more orderly. I heard someone talk this last week about their struggle. They were they're having trouble just personally. The backgrounds to their videos just they didn't like those. Their church videos, they 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 found it hard to have the background of that church video be less than perfect. I do not struggle with that problem. My shelves are a mess. The books are not really organized. I have books and things together that make no sense being next to each other. And I thought I would show you an example just, just to give you a sense of my mind and how it works. Uh, I just grabbed three books off my shelf. They happen to be sitting next to each other. And uh, the first one was this. Uh, this book was written in 1932. It's called The Hygiene of Marriage, and I found it for free, and I've used it to annoy my friends who were getting married with uh, uh, quotes that just always feel inappropriate, because that's who I am. Next to that, I had Ethical Dilemmas in Church Leadership. This one's a hard read, because it's real-life people struggling with real-life things. And I had the redi most ridiculous book in my library against one of the most serious one right next to grief. How to handle grief in ministry. I don't make sense. I'm sorry. It's just who I am. I don't make sense. This is my life. It's a mix of really serious, really ridiculous, and really, mel really messy. So, enjoy. So why am I talking about this? I have no idea if it's funny, entertaining, or whatever. I want to be a little more lighthearted with it. But I also want to remind you that it's okay to be you. It's okay to be you. You don't have to justify your imperfections. We all have them. They are on display. The beauty of being God's people is it's seen in the grace that we have for each other. The grace that defines us. God's grace looks at deeply imperfect people and still acts in love, acted in a way to bring the lost, the, the broken, the hurting, and the uncertain back to him because God sees the heart. And I encourage you to look for the hearts of people as well. Everybody has rough edges, and some of those rough edges are showing more now than ever before. Grace when given, can take the pressure off. And I don't know about you, but I could use the pressure being off for a little bit. It causes us to pay attention to what we have rather than what we're missing. The pressure being off, it lets people have bad days because we've all got them. It lets people say things that they might later regret because we all do. It lets us experience what we're really going through, what we're really feeling right now, and it lets us experience that authentically. Let's be people who give enough grace to not let the bad days, the ill-considered words, and the difficult moments redefine our connection to each other. Let's not let a messy office shelf determine what we think of the person that's speaking in the video. We are all in this together, and we can face it together. We will overcome this through the grace and the love and the power of God together. So how are you experiencing God today? I mean, take a moment and think, how are you experiencing God today? Where do you need to experience the presence and power of God today? What is God doing or speaking into your life that that maybe you don't see right now? What message is God trying to give you that we haven't quite heard yet? We're going to enter into a time of prayer, and as we do so, I want to invite you to let the Holy Spirit answer those questions. Uh, the Holy Spirit's our teacher. He, he's our guide. And he works. So let's let him do what he needs to do as we pray today. Let's pray.
Lord, your presence is needed in these moments. And it is possible for us to get so caught up in all of the negative and all of the things that aren't working right and all of the feelings and the, the stuff that has built up over the course of the last several weeks and having no means of, of expressing that effectively. It just it can take over and it can consume us. And Lord, we need your presence to cut through that today. The, those of us that are, are hurting and anxious, those of us that are suffering from some depression, those of us that are angry and upset, those of us that are experiencing very real loss, uh, loss of connection to the people around us, loss of a job and income, loss of relationship because of whatever different reason we might have. Lord, we've, we're experiencing this right now and we need your presence in the midst of it. Lord, show us where you're at work. Show us the message that you are wanting us to hear. Cut through all of the things that we're dealing with in such a way that we can know and experience you in new and profound ways. Many of the things that we've counted on for so long, they just aren't there or they look different now than they did six weeks ago. But you are still the same. Lord, you are strong. Lord, you are present. Lord, you give hope. Lord, you will guide us through. May we hear your voice today, and may your will be done. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. And amen. This time we'd normally pass a plate, but uh, we can't do that, so we invite to you to give an offering. Uh, many are, are sending checks to the church, and you can do that, certainly. 1063 South DeWitt, St. John's. Uh, other than that, you can give online. Uh, and giving online is secure. There's a small cost to the church involved with that, but it's, it's pretty minimal, and it's very easy to do. So you're welcome to do that as well. You can even set up a recurring gift. I know that's what Emily and I have done, just so that we don't have to think about it uh, anymore. We give because we are followers of Jesus. We give as an act of obedience. We give because we trust Christ. We trust God. In a world filled with uncertainty, God is not. He is his rock. He is our strength. He is our purpose. And he will see us through. Let us give as an act of faith and an act of discipleship, trusting him. Amen? Amen. We've been in 1 Peter for the last several weeks, and we're going to continue to be in 1 Peter for a while. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to actually kind of go out of order. We're going to come back to the first part of chapter 2 next week, but we're going to start kind of at the end. And so 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 through 25, it reads this way. For it is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you, are, when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that, free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were going astray like sheep, but now you've returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. Amen. Amen. My neck has been hurting all week. This is the complaint portion of the sermon. I have spent more time in front of a computer in the last six weeks than I probably do in six months. Zoom fatigue is a real thing. I'm beginning to realize that I might need a new office chair. The one I'm using now, it slowly sinks over the course of a day. I don't tend to notice it until it's uncomfortable. 
And yes, I am fully aware that there are jokes to be had here. Have fun. Whatever the reason, the longer I sit at my desk, the more my neck hurts. I am a walking definition of the phrase pain in the neck. This scripture, it talks about pain. And pain has a source. Pain can be internal. It can be an internal physical pain, like my neck. Or it can be external, such as a, uh, such as a beating, which is referenced in the scripture. It can be emotional. It can be mental. We experience pain when we experience loss, for example. It, it hurts to lose someone or something that we love. Pain produces an emotional response. In fact, pain itself is a, a form of an emotional response. And everybody responds to pain differently. Some people will just grit their teeth and bear it. Others will shut down. They'll just disappear. Some will get angry, like the fact that they're hurting just, it makes them furious. Some people will, will feel that pain and it'll, it'll cause them to cry or to weep or uh, to really express that pain in a, in, a, in a form of weakness. There is a cycle to pain. Pain can cause anger, it can cause anxiety, it causes depression. All of these things are common in people who experience chronic pain. You see one feeds another, and, and so we go through these stages of depressed and angry and anxious, and, and then we just circle back around and keep going through them over and over again. Pain can shape our identity. The pain we're experiencing, it can limit us in ways that that will often define us. Our pain becomes what we see in ourselves and what others see in us. We can be defined by the pain that we have. Pain is a given. And the scripture does not hide from that reality. It does not hide from the fact that there is pain and suffering in this world and we will all experience it. There is no magic button that takes away or causes us to be able to avoid pain entirely. Pain can invade our souls. It can break us down and it can extend outward from us. Those who are hurting have a tendency to hurt others. And they're often not even aware that that's what's going on. The focus of this scripture isn't on the, the reality that pain exists and whether it should or should not. The focus of the scripture is on how we endure it. How we face suffering. Because how we face suffering, it speaks to what we believe. Nobody signs up to suffer. And this is not an endorsement of suffering as if it's somehow this great or good thing. It isn't. It's simply the reality that we face. And I need to offer a disclaimer. I'm not talking here about abuse, especially kind that would be considered illegal. If you are a victim of abuse, if you are experiencing abuse or any other criminal act, then there are remedies to that. Please speak up and please seek help. That's not, the scripture is not excusing bad action in this way. It's speaking to how we face the suffering and pain that we have. As Christians, we point to the life and example of Jesus as our guide and our goal for living. And the central moment of Jesus' life is his time on the cross. The cross was not comfortable. I don't feel like I need to say that, but I feel like I should. Because sometimes we look at the pictures that we see up around in churches and homes and, and all that, and it doesn't convey the amount of pain and suffering that Jesus experienced at the cross. The cross in this day and age is a form of torture and the worst, one of the worst forms of torture that the Roman Empire had at its disposal. And it was used as an execution tool to just reduce a body to nothingness and reduce a reputation 
to nothingness as well. And this is the suffering that Christ took on himself for us. He is our example. And Peter says, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Let's make sure that we hear this. Jesus did no wrong and he told no lie. When abused unjustly, he did not respond with more abuse. When suffering for something he did not do, he offered no threat and he had no attack. He didn't even try to defend himself. Jesus trusted his life to God, knowing that God is the judge and that God acts justly. He endured pain. He experienced suffering. But that pain and suffering did not change who he was. He remained himself throughout. This is our example. Jesus says that we all have our crosses to bear, that each of us is going to face difficult moments and suffer simply because we're alive, simply because we've chosen to do right, simply because we're following Jesus. It is a part of life. And I think this should cause us to stop and think about what following Jesus looks like. And I know that this one might be a little uncomfortable for some folks, but I think it's important to see the distinction between truly following Jesus and cheering for Jesus. What do I mean? I think there's, there's a part of it is about hype. It's how excited we get and how excited we can get others. It's, uh, the hype can produce full altars and lots of tears or make Christianity seem like it's just about being happy. Cheering for Jesus tends to look this way. It's the 13-year-old girl who proudly claims to have been saved 13 times and baptized three. That's a real story from my past of someone that I worked with. Did that particular girl experience salvation? Yeah, I believe that she did. But instead of following Jesus and seeing what was next, she kept coming back. All she had was given at that point was more hype in order to reach the mountaintop, the pinnacle of what it means to follow Jesus, it had to have this emotional thing, this, this overwhelming thing that caused her to go back and back and back and back and back to the same spot. You see, connection with Jesus it isn't just about raising a hand when somebody asks us to. Following Jesus is about the reality of everyday life. It's not just one moment of decision to follow Jesus or not. It's the day-to-day, moment-by-moment decisions that shape who we are, that show what we believe and change how we act. Celebrate following Jesus. Certainly do that. There is joy in the Lord. Salvation is real. The altar is a great place to connect with God. This is all true. But also recognize that as we celebrate with Jesus, we will also suffer as Jesus did in bearing that cross. We will suffer as we face the sinful reality of this world. That we will go with Jesus into difficult situations, into hard conversations, and in through sacrificial actions. That following Jesus means that we're going to respond as Jesus did, and not as the world responded to him. Responding to sin with more sin is not the way of Jesus. That's the way of the world. Responding to hurt with more hurt isn't the way of Jesus. Responding to suffering with threats and harsh words isn't the way of Jesus. We follow the way of Jesus. That means that we trust the Father, that we trust God. I'm growing more and more aware that my opinion on things isn't as important as I think it should be, or as I might think it is. This coronavirus situation has brought a version of pain and suffering to most people, and everybody's responding their own way. 
I know I have known depression, anxiety, and anger. This week, and every week, if not every day. I see them pop up in conversations. I see them come up in me when I'm talking and something comes up and I have a strong opinion about it. This is a version of pain, a response to suffering. And so the question that I've been wrestling with and when I invite you to wrestle with is how do we choose to react to this? Are we going to continue that cycle of anger and anxiety and depression? Are we going to be one who just starts to offer threats and attacks? Are we going to add hurt to hurt through word and deed? Or perhaps maybe my thoughts and our thoughts and opinions are not more important than knowing and loving the people around us. Perhaps we can face the pain and suffering of this moment differently than people expect. And in doing so, open up a new way, open up a a new path through that isn't in that attack and hurt and go after mode or isn't in that just retreat from the world and, and, and duck your head until it's all over, but brings a level of grace, a level of goodness that the world needs right now. I want to say that responding as Jesus did is always the right approach. And so we need to pay attention to what he did and how he did it. In no way does the idea of following Jesus excuse away the hurt we feel or the suffering we face. There are things that are just unjust. We are suffering for things that we had done no wrong for. And so are others. This is a reality of a sinful world that we live in. And this does not excuse that away. It simply points it out that it's going to be there. It's there and it will continue to be there. The focus of the scripture is on the response. With Christ as our example and guide. And there's three thoughts that I want to bring out. First, Jesus trusted God. Even while on the cross, while all this was going on and suffering all that he was suffering, he trusted God. The response that led Jesus to and through the cross was his faith and trust in God. You see, God is the judge, and that means that I am not. Trusting God is giving to him my desire for justice, my giving my desire to to give up my need for vengeance or so that they'll get what they've got coming or that idea that I can somehow personally fix things according to what I think is right. And this is a hard thing to do. We have been taught that we must protect against or attack any perceived threat or injustice in order to be safe. But you know what struck me in this passage? That same action, that same thought, that same teaching was the path that the religious and political leaders took against Jesus. And they are not to be our example. Trusting God led Jesus to the cross and he went willingly. Trusting in our own sense of what was right and and what needed to be done and our desire to correct everything caused religious leaders, people devoted to God, to put him on a cross. I think this is worthy of thought. Peter describes God as the guardian of our soul. So he is the judge, and we are not. And he's also our guardian, our protector. God will give justice and God will make things right. That's what trusting Jesus looks like, like knowing that God is a God of justice and he's the judge and he will make it right in his way and in his time. And he will also guard the souls of his people. In the first chapter of 1 Peter, they talked about this inheritance of life that could never be altered or changed or taken away. And that's right there. The guardian of our souls protects us And it protects that inheritance. This is our future. God will see us through all pain and suffering. 
Do we trust God enough to not lash out at those we see as threatening us unfairly or treating us unfairly? Are we willing to face the injustice around us without becoming unjust ourselves? Can we experience hurt without allowing that hurt to define us? Without it becoming so central to our self-understanding that we can't talk about ourselves without it. If we can face suffering for doing right, if we can face suffering and do right in the midst of it, then Peter says that we have God's approval. Now, what does that mean, God's approval? God's favor, God's presence, yes, it means all those things. But in this case, it means that we take on the same spirit that Jesus had when he faced the cross. That same grace-filled presence that endured the suffering around him, endured the moment that was before him, knowing that he was safe in God's hands, knowing that this is something that would lead uh, others into a right relationship with God, knowing that this was necessary and it was what was in front of him in the moment. Essentially, God's approval in this case is us taking on that same spirit and nature of Jesus, is acting and living in such a way that grace is first, that we will follow God, will be guided by God. Even in being guided by God means that we're going to go into uncomfortable places and in difficult, make difficult decisions. And it means that we're going to love as God has loved us. Remember, the empty cross is a symbol of salvation. We look at a cross, we have one in the church, it's an empty cross. Jesus is not on it. Many of us have those, they're jewelry, they're in our homes, they're all around. And that thing that was once a torture device, a symbol of shame, has become a symbol of salvation. Because of Jesus. Because of the path that he chose to go through, to face what was in front of him. The presence of Jesus changed the essential nature of the cross from death to life. Doing right and following the example of Jesus moment by moment, day by day, it actually changes the world around us. It's God working through us in the midst of real life. You know, you might feel lost right now. There's everybody's struggling. There's uncertainty everywhere. What's going to happen? What's coming next? How's this all going to work out? We don't know. So what do we do? We face this moment in the way Jesus did. We trust God. We stand firmly in that trust and we stand up to all the pain and suffering knowing that it can't define us because we are children of God and that is our definition. We return to the shepherd. That's what Peter says at the end of this. Return to the shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Return, come back to him, enter into his presence because he is the guardian of our souls. He's the safest place we can be. He will guide us through all of this. And there's nothing that keeps us from him. If we return to him, if we trust him as Jesus did, then inside of us is born this grace-filled rock of salvation. The strength that can endure, that can enter into the mess and bring change, healing, help, love. The world needs us, not spouting off about all of our opinions on what's what and how come and why, 
The world needs us following Jesus, trusting God, living in such a way that we are doing right as best we can, day by day, authentically facing the difficult moments on the solid foundation of Jesus. I invite you, I encourage you, I implore you, return to Jesus. And whatever that looks like for you, there isn't a magic moment or way. But come to him. Really, really. Pick up that Bible. Spend some time in prayer. Talk to someone that you know and trust that has shown you what God looks like. Talk to me if you want. But know that when you return to Jesus, you are welcomed with open arms, filled with grace, and invited into that house as God's child. And that's the safest place to be today. May God bless you this week. May God guide you. May God shape you. May God cause you to act in a way that shows the world who he is. And may you experience the peace that passes all understanding in the house of the Lord as he works and lives in you. God bless you, and amen. Amen.